But he says this does not mean that charitable activity must somehow leave God and Christ aside. And yet, this is precisely what many regulations associated with state funding seek to force Christian organizations to do. Welcome to the Acton Vault Podcast, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Gabriel Jaja, producer. We go back in time to April 2011, when Samuel Gregg, current senior research fellow at the American Institute for Economic Research, discussed the social teaching of Benedict XVI, illustrating how much the Pope changed the focus of Christian engagement with political, social, and economic questions. Whether the subject was Islam, ecumenism, the rise and decline of the West, or simply, who is Jesus Christ? Benedict opened up discussions once considered taboo and caused even hardened secularists to rethink some of their positions. Two years after Greg's lecture, Pope Benedict XVI announced his resignation, and Jorge Bergoglio was elected his successor, assuming the name Pope Francis. You can find additional resources in the show notes of this episode as well as previous episodes on our website at acton.org slash podcast. If you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Acton Vault is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Thank you for coming. Um, My subject this afternoon is the social teaching of Benedict the Sixteenth. Now, I think in many ways this is actually quite a challenging subject, uh, mainly because Benedict's approach to Christian social doctrine is very different to the approach adopted by his predecessors. Uh, when Benedict's third encyclical, Caritas and Veritate, was published in 2009, I think many commentators struggled to explain this social encyclical, because Caritas and Veritate is a more intensely theological document than previous social encyclicals. And this, I think, is the key to understanding Benedict's social teaching. While this pope does offer specific suggestions about particular issues, Benedict is more interested in exploring more fundamental aspects of Christian social doctrine and then applying these insights to social political and economic problems. And I think this is important for two reasons. First of all, it's a subtle reminder, a subtle way of reminding Christians that most social and economic issues fall squarely into the area of what the church calls prudential judgment. There's no single Christian position, for example, on whether the state should control 21% or 22% of GDP. Strictly speaking, Christian social teaching focuses upon the articulation of principles, human dignity, freedom, solidarity, subsidiarity, the common good, and the preferential option for the poor. And while the church's social teaching certainly does rule out Christians taking particular positions, Christians, for example, can't be anarchists and they can't be communists, It does leave lay people with a lot of autonomy when it comes to the question of how we apply Christian social doctrine to today's problems. Now, the second reason I believe that Benedict's strongly theological approach to Christian social doctrine is important is that he's trying to remind Christians that when we think about social, political, and economic issues, we need to think like Christians, say that again, we need to think like Christians. Before he became Pope, Joseph Ratzinger wrote very little on the traditional subjects addressed by Christian social doctrine. We don't find, for example, in Ratzinger's writings very much about government, entrepreneurship, the welfare state, private property, trade unions, socialism, or capitalism. So does this mean that Ratzinger had no interest in subjects like freedom or justice or subsidiarity? Well, the answer is no, because from the very beginning of his theological work, Ratzinger was deeply interested in these questions. 
But what was different was his way of approaching these subjects. So what's the difference? The difference is that he believes that in the depths of Christian revelation, the revelation personified in Jesus Christ and entrusted to his church, we can find principles and insights that humans by themselves would have difficulty grasping. And it's precisely because these insights come from revelation that Benedict believes Christian social teaching is is about integrating these particular ideas and that Christians have a particular responsibility to integrate these insights into the project of making, as Paul VI once said, human life more humane. Now, this may seem strange, but I believe Benedict's desire to deepen the theological dimension of Christian social teaching is challenging for many Catholics and for many other Christians. Why? Because it makes us realize just how little we really think as Christians about social issues and how much we have adopted the perspective of the world. Now, everyone here at different times uses secular ways of thought. And by secular, I don't mean secular humanist. Rather, I mean secular in the original Latin meaning of the word. And we find this in the Latin New Testament of St. Jerome, which uses the word secular to identify the affairs of the world. But note, Jerome did not regard the affairs of this world as somehow being intrinsically evil or intrinsically bad. No, Jerome is simply talking about those things that are not divine, those things that are not ecclesiastical. Indeed, the church has always recognized that the secular sciences enjoy a certain autonomy and freedom of their own. And it was precisely because the church acknowledged this freedom that Christian thinkers established many of the foundations of the sciences, of economics, of business, of law, and of constitutional government. The temptation, however, for Christians, even many faithful Christians in our modern world, is to think in very secular terms about social problems and essentially ignore the insights that are suggested by Christian faith. Now, this creates many problems, one of which is that thinking exclusively in secular terms actually reduces our comprehension of reality. Now, secularists commonly accuse Christians of being unscientific, of being unrealistic, Now, there are many ways of responding to those sorts of statements, but if I'm discussing these claims purely on an intellectual level, my response is normally to say, no, if Christ is God, if Christ says who he says he is and who his church say he is, then it's not me, but you, the convinced secularist who's blinded himself to reality. And this, incidentally, is one reason, I think, why Benedict XVI has written his now two-volume book, Jesus of Nazareth. According to Benedict, Christ is who Christ says he is, the Son of God. And if this is true, then we start to realize that everything changes. Because if Christ is God, then what we know about his nature matters for our thinking about the social order. If Christ is God, then the nature of his church, it matters for our thinking about the social order. If Christ is God, then what he reveals about himself and the last things matters for our thinking about the social order. I think many of you will know that the, um, the word radical comes from the Latin phrase radix, which means root. And I think it's in this sense that Benedict is genuinely a radical pope because his approach to renewing Christian social ethics is to go back to the roots, go back to the radix of Christianity because this is the way he says, quote, we can make visible again the center of Christian life, which is Christ and his church 
and then shine that light upon the world so that we might see the truth about ourselves and the world as well. So it's from this standpoint that I'd like to explore with you today how Benedict has shaped the church's approach to social and economic questions. And in doing so, I'm going to draw upon all three of Benedict's encyclicals because all three of them have profound implications for Christian social doctrine. And in keeping with this Trinitarian theme, I'm going to look at three issues. First, I'm going to consider how Benedict's exploration of the nature of Christ, Christ as Logos, Christ as Caritas, how this affects Christian social ethics. The second thing I'm going to do is examine the Pope's thinking about the nature of the church and what that suggests for how we approach social problems third thing I'm going to do is look at another theme strongly stressed by Benedict, which is the theme of eschatology, the reality of the last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. So let's begin with Christ. In all three of Benedict's encyclicals, it's striking how much of his commentary on social matters is informed by direct reflection upon the nature of Christ. At the very beginning of Caritas and Veritate, Benedict states that sacred scripture, tradition, and the church fathers remind us that Jesus Christ reveals himself simultaneously as agape and logos. Agape tells us that Jesus is divine love and divine mercy, but logos tells us that Christ is also divine truth, divine reason, and divine justice. Now, on this basis, this conception of Christ as absolute truth and of eternal love, Benedict offers four important points that are very relevant to Christian activity in this world. The first and most obvious point is that at the center of any Christian reflection upon social problems must be the person of Jesus Christ. Now, that might seem self-evident to some of us. But I think Benedict emphasizes this point because he wants us to understand that Christ is not whoever we want him to be. Christ is not a therapist. Christ is not a guru. Christ is not a revolutionary. Christ is not a political activist. Christ is not a trade unionist. Christ is not a businessman. And Christ is most certainly not a politician. Christ simply cannot be bound by our merely human categories. In other words, Benedict is warning us against the temptation to reduce Christ to any of our human categories whenever we think about social problems. Because the moment we make that error, then we instrumentalize Christ, which means we treat him as being less than God. The second point flowing from Benedict's emphasis upon Christ as agape and Christ as logos, is that it gives new meaning to the principle of solidarity. The principle of solidarity is very simple. It's all about our responsibilities to our fellow human beings. In other words, solidarity is in many senses concerned with justice. The idea of Christ as agape, however, invests this principle of solidarity with new significance. It reminds us that solidarity is about justice, but also that solidarity is more than just justice. It reminds us that any pursuit of justice that closes itself to the ultimate horizons revealed by divine love can easily degenerate into a harsh formality which denies the possibility of forgiveness and redemption. When justice is not associated with love, then our ability to see the one whom we help as our flesh and blood neighbor, weak and fallible just like us, starts to become limited. Of course, Benedict says in Caritas and Veritate that justice is, quote, an integral part of love, indeed, in truth. But he also says that Christian love demands that we go beyond strict justice Because charity, Benedict says, transcends justice and completes it in the logic of giving and forgiving. 
So let me give you a practical example that Benedict himself uses in Caritas and Veritate. In the marketplace, the primary form of justice is commutative justice. That essentially is about the fulfilling of contracts and promises. As Benedict says, commutative justice is essential for assessing the justice of exchanges within the marketplace. But, Benedict says, this is compatible with an attention to the demands of love. It's true, Benedict says, that justice and love have different inner logics. Justice, the entire Christian tradition maintains, is primarily about rendering to others and to God what they are due. The internal logic of love, however, is one of gift. As Benedict says, to love is to give, to offer what is mine to another person. So what does this mean in the marketplace? It simply means that the demands of commutative justice do not exhaust the content of the relationships we have with people whom we encounter in the marketplace. Commutative justice requires me to fulfill all the reasonable promises I freely make when I freely enter into a contract. But there's two ways in which I can do this. I can fulfill a contract in a very legalistic way and do the bare minimum. If, however, I try to fulfill the commandment to love my neighbor, then I will see that I have opportunities to go beyond the strict demands, the strict legal demands of the contract and treat the other person as a person rather than simply as another legal entity. Now, please note, this does not mean that we should be compelled by the state to do so. You cannot coerce actions motivated by love. You cannot compel generosity. The Pope's point is simply this, that a concern for commutative justice or any other form of justice does not exclude acts of generosity or acts of mercy. The third point, the third point flowing from Benedict's attention to Christ as agape and Christ as logos is that it reminds us that Christian love must not be confused with sentimentalism. Why? Because the demands of truth, logos, require us to love our neighbor in ways that reflect the truth about man. Now, in one sense, this means that love and a concern for love does not excuse people from the demands of justice. But it also tells us that loving our neighbor means that we need to use our reason when we think about how to help our neighbor. Our reason tells us, for example, <clears throat> that integral human development, which is a phrase used in Caritas and Veritate, is not simply material development. Integral human development is also moral and spiritual in nature. So while material development is important, we cannot reduce development to the, deve to the material realm. Now, of course, in the face of extreme poverty, it's natural for many of us to make that mistake. But it's still a mistake. Human flourishing includes material development, but it can't be reduced to material development. A fourth truth. A fourth truth revealed by this idea of Christ as agape and Christ as logos is that God wants us to be the source of our own integral development. Now, this means that if we are going to participate in the moral and spiritual goods that constitute human flourishing, then we must use our reason to identify and choose these goods for ourselves. In other words, if we want others to put on Christ, as St. Paul says, then we must give them space to choose. And this, of course, I think, deepens our understanding of the principle of subsidiarity. Many people, including many Christians, think about the principle of subsidiarity in terms of efficiency, effectiveness, 
Well, subsidiarity usually does create efficiency and effectiveness, but efficiency and effectiveness are not the primary point of subsidiarity. The primary point of subsidiarity is providing people with the space and, if necessary, the help they need to make free choices for the good. Jesus Christ is indeed a God who loves us. Indeed, he loves us so much that he's willing to risk that we might choose to reject him. But God is also a God who, as Benedict writes, quote, takes us seriously. And taking people seriously means presenting them with the truth and allowing them the freedom to either live that truth or reject that truth and to accept the consequences of their choices. So these are some of the ways in which I think Benedict's focus on Christ brings a richer Christological focus to Christian social doctrine. So let's turn to the second dimension of Benedict's contribution to Christian social thought, which is how the nature of the church should shape our approach to social, political and economic questions. I think it's common knowledge that one of Benedict's major reference points is St. Augustine, especially his book, The City of God. And as many of you know, this book is perhaps one of the most important influences upon Western civilization. And in many of his writings, Benedict uses this book and its distinctions between the city of God, the church, and the city of man, the world, to make important points about the nature and the limits of the church's engagement with the world. Now, I think there are two ways in which this Augustinian theme features in Benedict's social teaching, especially in Deus Caritas Est. The first point stressed by Benedict is that the church's work for a better world is not primarily driven by concern for justice. Speaking to the International Theological Commission in 2010, Benedict was very explicit about this. He said, quote, the social commitment of Christians derives from the manifestation of divine love. Thus, what truly distinguishes the church from the world when it comes to addressing problems is that the church, the city of God, is motivated primarily by love. By contrast, the world, especially the political world, is primarily focused upon justice. And the demands of justice, Benedict says, are to be found primarily in the natural law. Catholic social doctrine, as, as many of you know, very influenced by natural law thinking. And this is important, Benedict says, because it helps Catholics and other Christians to find common ground with others as we seek to build a better world. But almost immediately after he writes this, Benedict stresses that the distinctive mark of the church is not justice, but love. It follows that the emphasis that the church brings to social problems is an attention to the demands of love and a commitment to works of mercy and works of charity. And here's Benedict's key point. These are not the same thing as political activism. This is very important for us to remember because, as Benedict says, many people, such as Karl Marx, traditionally view works of charity and works of mercy as a barrier to justice. And responding to that argument, Benedict says, quote, love will always prove necessary, even in the most just society. There is no ordering of the state so just that it can eliminate the need for a service of love. Whoever wants to eliminate love is preparing to eliminate man, end quote. Justice, in other words, is not enough. The pursuit of justice cannot resolve very common, very real and very human problems like loneliness, depression, consumerism or alcoholism. Helping people with these types of problems requires a commitment that can only be sustained by our willingness to love another person in very concrete, specific ways. 
It's not coincidental, by the way, that Deus Caritas Est mentions Blessed Teresa of Calcutta several times as a model of Christian charity. We forget that during her life she was criticized by many people, including many Christians, for devoting herself to helping some of the most helpless people in the world instead of being out there on the barricades agitating for political change. Defending her approach to poverty, Benedict stresses, quote, Christian love does not simply offer people material help. It also offers refreshment for their souls, something which often is even more necessary than material support. And then Benedict makes his argument sharper. In the end, he says, quote, the claim that just social structures would make works of charity superfluous marks a materialist conception of man, the mistaken notion that man can live by bread alone, a conviction which demeans man and ultimately disregards all that is specifically human. So the second point, the second point flowing from Benedict's emphasis on the church as the city of God is his attention to the distance the church must maintain between itself and the world of politics. All through Deus Caritas Est, the Pope stresses that the church does not provide political solutions. The church, he says, quote, cannot and must not take upon herself the political battle to bring about the most just society possible, end quote. Why? Because the church is not a political movement. The church is not a welfare agency. The church is not a state bureaucracy. Instead, the church's primary responsibilities regarding the state are first to remind politicians of the demands of reason, and secondly, to purify that reason, our limited human reason, with the divine revelation that has been given to the city of God. So, on one level, Benedict believes the church, the city of God, must maintain an intellectual distance from the city of man. But he also believes that the city of God must remain organizationally distinct from the city of man. In Deus Caritas Est, Benedict warns us against blurring the identity of church charities through too close an association with the state. He insists that, quote, the specific expressions of ecclesial charity can never be confused with the activity of the state, end quote. Now, anyone here who is familiar with Christian charitable organizations throughout the world knows that close association with the state creates many difficulties. Acceptance of state funding, for instance, increasingly requires adherence to regulations concerning who charities may employ or even what charities might publicly say. Benedict doesn't suggest that Christian charities are required to somehow impose the gospel on anyone, but he says this does not mean that charitable activity must somehow leave God and Christ aside. And yet, this is precisely what many regulations associated with state funding seek to force Christian organizations to do. But even worse, even worse are those cases in which Christian charities start to censor themselves. We all know who they are when they voluntarily cease to speak about Christ or voluntarily start to act in ways that deny Christ's moral teaching because they're worried they might lose state funding. The implication of Benedict's position is that Christian charities must maintain an organizational distance from the state because they cannot compromise their integrity as ambassadors of the city of God to the city of man. So <clears throat> we've seen now that Benedict's attention to the nature of the church has profound implications for how we address questions of justice. And this issue of justice brings us to the last area in which I believe Benedict has influenced Christian social thought. And this concerns the last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. 
When you look through Benedict's writings, but especially his encyclical, Space Salvi, Benedict stresses over and over again that the last things are real. Why? Well, first of all, because Christ himself has told us that they are real. The last things are not imaginary. The last things are not fictions. They are real. And because they are real, every Christian should incorporate awareness of this truth into their thinking about social questions. The second reason I believe that Benedict has emphasized the last things is that he believes that many Christians have lost sight of their importance. In one of the most revealing parts of the 2002 book interview of Benedict entitled Light of the World, the Pope stated that in recent decades, Christian preaching has virtually stopped mentioning the last things. Indeed, Benedict says, preaching has become, quote, one-sided in that it is largely directed towards the creation of a better world while hardly anyone talks anymore about the other truly better world. Now, in the case of the Catholic Church, for example, I think it's true to say that after the Second Vatican Council, Catholic involvement in movements for justice intensified. Entire religious orders, for example, made the, the pursuit of justice their number one concern. But by the 1980s, I think it's true to say that some Catholics had essentially reduced the content of the Catholic faith to a concern for earthly justice. And of course, earthly justice is very important. But Benedict insists we must place it in the context of the Christian belief in the limits of earthly justice and the reality of divine justice. If we do not, Benedict says, then we end up reducing Christianity to what he describes as, quote, political moralism, as happened in liberation theology, end quote. It also encourages us to create secular messiahs who, not being God, cannot possibly fulfill religious-like expectations of hope and change. Now, of course, we know that the Christian God is a God of justice. Christ assures us there will be a final reckoning. Not everyone is going to heaven. But Benedict's identification of Christ as the judge who will truly and finally settle all accounts allows Benedict to incorporate a penetrating critique of utopianism into Christian social thought. This is very central to his encyclical Space Salvi. Christians know, Benedict says, that sinful humanity cannot realize perfect justice in this world. Quote, we can try to limit suffering, to fight against it, Benedict writes, but we cannot eliminate it. This Christian truth helps us to realize, like St. Augustine, that what fallen human beings can achieve is always much less than we otherwise might wish. Now, I suspect that many of you here today know that this point was central. This was central to Benedict's disputes with the liberation theologians. One of Ratzinger's criticisms of liberation theology was its tendency to reduce the kingdom of heaven to very earthly, very human utopias. One of liberation theology's defects, Benedict says, was it's an adoption of an understanding of hope that contradicted the Christian understanding of this theological virtue. The relevance of this point about eschatology and hope, however, is not limited to critiques of liberation theology. It has direct implications for how we think about justice in this world. In Space Salvi, Benedict argued that Christianity's insistence upon the hope of eternal life fundamentally reorientated human history. Why? Because it saved pagan Europe from an understanding of life as essentially purposeless. Christianity encouraged people to view the world as a world characterized by reason, by purpose, 
rather than by irrationality and a lack of meaning. In other words, the same God who gave man hope of eternal life was understood to be a thoroughly rational deity, logos, rather than being just another irrational divinity. But Benedict then poses the question of what happens when Christian hope begins to disappear from society's horizon. It produces, he says, ideologies of progress in which people imagine that ultimate justice, the kingdom of heaven, can be realized on earth. Unfortunately, Benedict cautions, quote, anyone who promises the better world guaranteed to last forever is making a false promise, end quote. The French Revolution, Benedict says, was the first political attempt to implement this ideology, and it ended in blood. The same logic, he says, was central to the Marxist project, and it also ended in destruction and death. But <clears throat> there's another problem with ideologies of progress that try to produce the perfect society. And this, Benedict says, is the fact that they forget man, and they particularly forget human freedom. In other words, once we accept the truth that human beings are free, if we accept the truth of human liberty, we know that society can never be static. It can never be perfect. It can never be completely just. There is no human-engineered end of history. Now, this linkage between eschatological hope, human justice, and human liberty has, Benedict says, positive implications and negative implications for Christians when we confront social problems. The negative effect is to induce in us a sober Augustinian realism. As Christians, we know eternal happiness can only be found in heaven. This means that while we ought to strive to make life more just, we should be suspicious of any impulse that leads us towards trying to realize ultimate justice in the here and now. Utopia, as Sir Thomas More knew when he gave his famous book that title, literally means no place. And that is where justice, which is not based upon an authentically Christian understanding of hope, will lead us. The no place of relativism, despair, and tyranny. There is, however, a positive dimension to this situation in which we yearn for ultimate justice, but find ourselves unable to realize perfect justice in this world. And this concerns human freedom. Benedict's anti-utopianism reminds us that any activity undertaken in the name of justice must embody a powerful concern for preserving and promoting human freedom. In any utopia, people no longer need to make meaningful choices. Why? Because in utopia, everything is already settled. Everything is already decided. In other words, as Benedict says, any structure that, quote, could try to guarantee a determined state of the world would mean denying man's freedom. This means that people need space to make choices. These decisions, the Pope says, can't simply be made in advance for us by other people, because if that was the case, we would no longer be free. So what does this mean? It means that while the structures of justice are important, they cannot and must not marginalize human freedom. And we as Christians should ask ourselves this question every time we become involved in what we think is a movement for justice. And the question is this, does this movement create space for freedom or are we suffocating liberty in the name of justice? So, <clears throat> to conclude, at the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that I think that Benedict is, in his own way, a radical pope. Now, when I say this, people are usually very surprised 
even a little shocked, perhaps, I think, because they may regard Joseph Ratzinger as a very conservative, even reactionary man. But I think as we've seen in, in his approach to social teaching, Benedict is indeed radical in his willingness to go to the heart of the fullness of divine revelation about Christ, his church, and the last things, and to show us how they ought to inform all Christians as we grapple with social problems. Now, this radicality, I believe, reflects Benedict's conviction that many Christians have forgotten that Christian faith is not marginal to reality. It is, in fact, the ultimate reality. But I think that another reason why Benedict stresses this point, especially when it comes to Christian social ethics, is his belief that the civilizations in which we live, move, and have our being do not fully conform to Christian truth. Now, of course, Benedict is not interested in trying to create utopia on earth. He is, however, convinced that the Western culture, which was given its soul by Christianity, has lost sight of these theological truths. Love has been reduced to sentimental humanitarianism. Truth has been reduced to mathematics. Liberty has been reduced to license. Reason has been reduced to rationalization. And justice has been reduced to power. And where Western civilization goes, the rest of the world tends to follow. And in the end, it results in the same thing. Practical atheism, at the heart of which is a teddy bear Christ, who, as Benedict wrote many years ago, quote, demands nothing, never scolds, who accepts everyone and everything, who no longer does anything but affirm us. Now, the question as to why civilizations should prefer sentimentalism to love, power to justice, or rationalization to reason is puzzling. How is it possible, Benedict once wrote, for man to say no to the greatest one of all and to close our lives in upon ourselves? The answer, Benedict says, is obvious. They have never actually experienced God. They have never had a taste of God. They have never felt how precious it is to be loved by God. And here, I think, we find the essence of Benedict's contribution to Christian social doctrine. Indeed, I think it's the essence of his entire pontificate. And like most truly profound things, it's very simple. He wants us, as the mystical body of Christ, as the people of God, to bring others to know and love God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We often tend to think of Christian social teaching as the church's contribution to building a better world. And that's true. But Christian social teaching is, like all Christian doctrine, ultimately about evangelization, of proposing over and over and over again through our actions and our words the truth of Jesus Christ. And it does not matter whether this truth is proposed to a Western European atheist, a cynical, lapsed American Catholic, an adherent of paganism, or someone who has never heard of Christ. Of course, the embrace of Christian truth doesn't guarantee success in this world. But to the same unbelieving world, Benedict's message is this. What have you got to lose? Your unbelief? Is that really a loss? Yes, the laws, the ways of the Lord <clears throat> are not comfortable. But as human beings, we are not made for comfort. We are made for goodness. And this is where the most humble of laborers in the vineyard of the Lord, I think, and I'm sure the, bet the Pope thinks, will find not only happiness, but ultimately true greatness as well. So thank you. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners, 
Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you like to hear more of. If you're familiar with our past content or have attended an Acton event and would like to see it in a future episode, you can email us at producer at Acton.org. Until next week, for Acton Vault, I'm Gabriel Zsa. Zsa.